The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by listeners like you via the Secret Library Podcast Patreon. You can check it out and become a supporter at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 123. My guest this week is Tasha Harrison, who you will remember from her previous appearance. Actually, she's been on twice. We've talked about sex scenes, and about this time last year, she was on with Kate Newberg, and we were talking about NaNoWriMo. So as we're getting into November again, I wanted to have another conversation about NaNoWriMo with Tasha, as she is a longtime NaNoWriMer habituate, much like me. And we have gone through methods that worked, methods that didn't work. And one of the things we've learned how to do is to hack NaNoWriMo to serve our own purposes. And so this week, I really wanted, as many of us are diving into NaNoWriMo that happens every November, and setting off with great hopes and expectations about what we can accomplish this month in our writing. I wanted to share some tips, guidelines, and one mind-blowing discovery we made while discussing ways we want to approach this so that you can have a really amazing NaNoWriMo that works for you. Okay, here we go with Tasha. Hey, Tasha. Thanks for coming on. Hey, Caroline. It's fun having you on again. Um, So we had... Tasha and Kate on, we recorded, we realized just over a year ago when we were in New Orleans and talked about NaNoWriMo. And we wanted everybody to think about, you know, how can you use NaNoWriMo? Is NaNoWriMo right for you or is it not? And we shared some of the tools that we like to use. They really got into it with the spreadsheets and everything. It was (laughs) was a little nuts. Yeah. It was very exciting. Um, (laughs) But Tasha and I were talking about NaNoWriMo again this year and realized we're both using it in a different way this time than we have previously. And so we wanted to do a NaNoWriMo 2.0 episode of maybe some unexpected ways to use it or ways that the NaNoWriMo site and language doesn't really talk about as much. Right. Not starting a new project. Right, that's basically it. Is that they always say, you know, don't think about your project before the day. You can plan, but you can't write. And they have this whole thing about it, which I'm into if you've never written a book before and you're really scared as to whether or not you can write that much. But I don't think that's the only way to do it. It's definitely not the only way to do it. And also that energy is kind of annoying to me. Like, okay. oh, don't look at your project. Don't think about your project. Unless you have to think about the project. And also, you might be writing a little bit on the project as you're thinking about it. So like this whole, is like, you can't, well, it's the competitive thing. It's like, you can't start before. Remember, Kate was like, oh, mm-hmm. my God, like, you're just going to put some words that you already wrote into it. You're cheating. I'm like, what oh, is right. cheating? <laughs> it's like, what I know, is cheating at NaNoWriMo? You cheated. You cheated. I'm like, no, Because there's a huge cash prize at the end. Where's my cash and prizes? I won I know, last there's year. No, <laughs> there's no cash and prizes. That's one thing. So I think we would, would like to encourage you to tailor NaNoWriMo to your own needs because it's not a cash prize. It's not something. No. It's the only person I mean, who wins or loses is you. Right, right. I think they do have like some discounted um, like software. Like they have Scrivener sometimes in there. Right. And, but um, nothing I could use was in there this year. So, and oh. I don't need another t-shirt. I'm good. <laughs> no, it's true. I had so many of them at one point. Um, I used to buy them actually in advance and then say I would feel I'm shame <laughs> while wearing it if I didn't finish. So that was one of my motivations. You're not a winner. You can't wear that shirt, Caroline. <sighs> you bought a shirt you can't wear. I mean, now I wouldn't really care about that. But it, at the time, I, I, it felt very motivating. But yeah. I think what, what I'm coming to is I've been working on this book for a little, over a year. Mm. and Same book you getting... started last year. Oh, yeah, same book. Um, and I've been working on it. I've been working on it more being in Berlin, which is great, Mm -hmm. but I really need to finish the first draft. I need the first draft done. So I was thinking NaNoWriMo would be a good way to turn up the volume, so to speak, or turn up the heat on writing this draft. Or just to add a sense of urgency, you know, like if you were just writing your first book, there's really no deadline in place, so you don't feel like 
rushed, you can put it aside for a while. Like even as an indie author, I've had people. So like my book from last year was the one that I did for NaNoWriMo. And I ended up killing half of the book because I wrote so much garbage just trying to meet the word count, which is yeah, like no one ever talks about the amount of fluff that you put into a book. That book ended up being 80K words and probably about 60 of it was just complete bullshit that I could not use. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I had to go in and cut out a whole bunch of stuff and start from scratch. And my initial goal was to publish that book in January, but it was so shitty that I've been working on, I've been fixing this book for a year now. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So like you said, with just finishing a project, I'm pretty much at the point where I'm sick of this book. I don't want to see this book anymore. I'm tired of these characters. I want to burn it down. So going back and using it as a NaNoWriMo project instead of starting with something new, which is always my inclination because, you know, shiny object syndrome. Yeah, Um, of course. (laughs) I have so many ideas in my head and I can't wait to write them, but... I have to finish this first. So that's how I'm going to use it. Okay. So my question is, if you are looking at your experience from last year, so you wrote a whole bunch last year, felt like it was too much fluff and you had to cut half of it. How are you going to change your mindset this year? So you don't have the same issue. Mine is that I have to use contractions and I can't take them out just to get the word count up. <laughs> can't Because it sounds Will crazy. Not. Everyone sounds super proper. Um, and from the 1700s. Yes. Uh, I can't really tell you how I'm going to quell that competitive nature. It's like, the reason why I wrote so much fluff is because I was I wanted to meet the word count every day. Every day I had to meet it. And even if I knew that 500 words was enough, you know, it's like, oh, I finished this scene. I did what I was supposed to here. I ended up writing like another thousand words just so I can reach the fucking word count. And that's stupid. So I didn't realize that I was going to be so competitive. One. Um, Two. (laughs) Two, I don't know how to quell that. Uh, I probably won't be as dialed into like oh, I've reached my word count today, like chiming in. Maybe that will keep it at a minimum. I don't know. I really hope that I don't fall into that cycle again. I don't... I also, too, have a firmer grasp of where I'm going with the ending, so maybe that'll help, too. I know more what my characters need. I know what... Like, because at first I was discovering... Yes, I had done, like, a character sketch and all that stuff, but I was still discovering his voice, so... I think I have a firmer grasp now, and maybe that'll keep me from overwriting. We'll see. I think something that I'm going to try that I'm hoping will help is that there's a good amount of scenes in my book that happen in flashback because Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book, the character's father has died. And so she's moving forward with her life, but she's also exploring her relationship with him. So these things go back. So I think that I could think I could write all of the flashback scenes that I'm thinking of as possibilities, knowing that I won't use all of them. But just to get their relationship as clear as possible, I think that's something I can do with word count competitiveness. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Is like write the B-sides of the scene options and say, Uh, okay, is or is this actually more interesting than what I thought I needed? Then I will use this instead. Right. Um, I think that's also, that's probably a good idea, like to write things that you're not absolutely sure you're going to use, but because it's all discovery, right? Like we talked about that before, like there's no wasted words you discover something about yourself or the character or the story that you're writing, regardless to whether or not you use it in the book. Uh, I was thinking of another idea that, um, because part of the problem that I had was that I wrote an epilogue and I thought that was the end, which wasn't the end. It's kind of like a flash forward, right? So my process is I like to write the last chapter, the, the conflict and the dark moment, and then the, the first chapter. So then that way, like, I kind of have, like, a, you know, signpost. I wrote the epilogue thinking that I had an ending. I didn't have an ending. So all this time, I'm writing towards an end that I don't really have. And I think that was oh. why I was 
I was kind of floundering. So I'm basically starting from the midpoint and rewriting that whole part. And I'm going to start from the end. I might and write go the backwards? first. backwards? Yes, write the last chapter and then go that way. What, like memento? Yes, like memento. Just piece the shit together, like backwards. That is so interesting. I've, had, I've never thought of doing that. Because I already know where the signposts are, it makes sense. And it will also keep me on my make me adhere to the outline because otherwise like i'm like oh this will be a cute scene to add you know what i mean like if you're writing in a straight line but i don't need that scene who cares how fucking cute it is so if i start at the end and i know exactly what i need here and what i need at the end and write backwards then maybe i, I can think get this is done. genius my, my, <laughs> i'm having this weird like like you know, Austin Powers kind of, that's just so crazy. It mm. might work. It just mm. might. We'll see what happens. get Mr. Bigglesworth out. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because just because you read something from start to finish doesn't mean you have to write it that way. Right. I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm not a linear writer anyway. So like the idea doesn't seem completely ridiculous to me. It would be the first time I don't I've think it's ridiculous it. at all. So I think that would probably be my plan. And if this shit works out, I'm going to start doing it all the time. <laughs> I think it's great. I could see writing like the first act to get that clear mm-hmm. and then going, going backwards to, from the rest of it. And, you can re- and then you can revise forward yes, so that it all follows. But you could see? write backwards. It's like um, I've done these maps. A friend of mine who's an architect is always talking about critical path method where when you're designing a building and building a building there are certain things that need to arrive or need to be in place in order for another process to start like you can't a good example is you can't put an elevator in until the elevator shaft is finished right right. so there are processes that have to be complete so she started looking at ways to plan your life that way and did these maps which are of course with beautiful architect handwriting but you put the end goal in mind And let's say you have a notebook open that has two pages and it's laying flat. So you put your goal in the top right corner and put a box around it. And then you draw a line down towards the left and say, what's the thing that has to be done immediately before this goal? And then you keep going down and backwards until you get to something you can do today. Oh my God. I'm so into this. It's so great. But this feels like that, but for a, for a novel. I really like this idea. Well, I mean, there's lots of things you can do for goal setting, period. Um, But a lot of the goal setting stuff that's out there is like, here's your big goal in the center. And then these are all the small things that you need to do to reach it. But there's really no roadmap. You know what I mean? Like, we tend to do the things that we want to do, kind of like writing a book, like writing a book. It's like, oh, I like this scene. I'm going to write this instead of the hard stuff, you know? Right. I'm going to skip that one and I'm going to keep having her go to the coffee right. shop. Right. But then over. you're still like, <laughs> did they get out of this the fucking coffee shop? my personal addiction. Yeah. <laughs> People eating, drinking. It's not just you, Caroline. I, I recently I edited a book where literally every conversation that happened between the characters, they were either having a meeting or eating. I'm like, get these people out of doors. Get them it's off their tough, asses. It's tough though, man. It's hard. Because I mean, you're like, when do I talk to people? I mean, I do talk to people not when I'm eating, but I do. I guess I eat a lot. (laughs) It's like, oh, snackies. I work in coffee shops. (laughs) Feels like I'm always drinking coffee. That's where I think more. I don't know. It's hard to give up. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of people do that. Like, you can always tell, too, if someone has... I can always tell if an author has, like, an office job because, like seriously nothing ever happens unless they're sitting at a desk i'm like Uh, they don't have to look these people right in the eye you know they can walk they can do other things they can stand up and move around but that (laughs) that's neither here nor there but what this whole idea of having like a straight line of things going in reverse of what you need to accomplish before you get to the goal is really appealing to me i like that idea and I think I'm probably going to map it out that way. It's like, okay, so this is the ending. This is where I need to be. How do we figure out how to get these characters here? What needs to happen before this and then before that? Oh, God, I'm, I'm into it. What if we made one as if we were the character trying to plan their own life? Caroline. Like, what if you made a life map <laughs> yeah, as what, the what, character? <laughs> That probably would be awesome. Also, it would be right, a, but it would also be one of those things where, um, 
procrastination nation. I could get really true. Up in true. It. I mean, you could do it. I, I have a tendency to take a lot of personality tests online as my characters and then read the results and be like, ooh, it's so great. Um, I find it very helpful, but it is a little bit addictive, so you I can't mean, do it all the time. Yeah, I do that with uh, interviews. Like, I will interview my character, like, six yep. weeks to Sunday. I know everything there is to know about the, this person, like, all the way down to, And it's, like, they appear once, and they're, like, a shopkeeper. And you're, like, oh, Like, I, I can't know. even give him a name because he doesn't even have any talking lines. Like, Nothing. he's just literally the guy with the brown sweater in the back that smells of cheese. Yeah, Why? he's just going <laughs> to hand over the change, and that's the end of it. And you're, like, but, I, but what about his family he's history? This, it's so amazing. the whole story. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I... I definitely would probably get really wrapped up in that. I can see myself doing that. I'm thinking like main character and maybe a larger secondary character would get this treatment. I'm thinking, I'm not thinking everybody needs it, but main I character. I mean, that, that's logic, but who Yeah, who I mean, logically? who follows that? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> Especially not when like panicked about a difficult scene. Okay, so the last year you were hung up, they were still in the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten them out of the coffee shop. I've gotten them out of the coffee shop. She's gone to uh, several parties. Oh, nice. I have nice. seen um, after school flashback scene where she gets in trouble because she's gone somewhere she's not supposed to, and she's like on the sports fields. So Ooh. yeah, we've gotten no food away involved. from the coffee. No food at all. Somebody might have been having a snack in the bleachers. I can't. I can't lie about that. I can't remember. But. Um, yeah, there's a there's it's definitely moved and the setting I really think hard about setting because I know that my default is to stay in an eating establishment mm-hmm. or a home just with stabbed food. characters just like picking gotta up their get plates. away get away. So where were you like? Why do you feel the need to add this sense of urgency for like to put it in a nanorama again? Like, do you did you? After NaNoWriMo last year, did you really not write a whole lot more? Or Well, I didn't even really do NaNoWriMo last year because I was working a really busy day job and mm. um, doing the show and doing other stuff alongside it. So my writing was getting the shaft, basically. And I think that it's a nice way for me doing it this year to just build in the habit. I've been writing more, but I think there are other things that I do here that I don't want to lose the momentum on having a writing habit, having moved to another continent in order to establish a larger (laughs) writing habit. It's a big priority for me to make sure that sticks. So this is why we're here. Yeah. I came here to write a book, damn it. Yes. Yes. And there there are always things that come up, like dealing with our visas and, you know, other things that come up. So I, but if I make this non-negotiable, then it will fit in along with everything else. Right. And I think so that's basically you're, maybe you need to just establish a writing habit. Yes. This month in, in November. That instead is of the, you know what I mean? I think at mine ebbs and flows. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll go through periods where I'm literally writing every day. And then I'll go through periods where I'm making excuses to write everything but my book. <laughs> it's <laughs> like oh like I just did this character creation workbook. And launched that last week and my whole thing was all summer is like oh I can't write fiction because I'm writing this but I also wasn't writing the workbook either I was just like writing maybe 200 words on it and then like oh close the document and let's watch Netflix yeah it's hard to stick to a routine when you have a day job yeah because you never I mean the ver- there's so many variables like you don't know what the day is gonna how you're going to be taxed energetically during the day so sometimes I just don't have anything left, you know? Yeah. So establishing a writing habit would be good. And I don't want to hear any of this 5 a.m. Writers Club shit because... No, no. I mean, I used to be into that. It's very strange. I think that where we are in the world has really impacted our sort of internal clocks. Because when you're on the West Coast everybody is done with their day by the time you get up. So there's this sense Mm -hmm. of being behind when you wake up. So we used to wake up really early there, like six and be like, we better get into it. And now that we're in Germany, I've noticed you're ahead. (laughs) We're ahead. We're way, we're like, whatever. We're going to sleep till seven 30. You know, haven't started their day yet. (laughs) No, no, we're first, man. We're like the only people beating us is like Japan. So, um, I mean, we're not going to win there. So I think that, 
it's it feels different and it's also i mean it's darker here you know so it's we really like hibernating and having a little bit more <laughs> so it's just different i i'm noticing i'm writing better in the afternoon here than i did in california i wrote much better in the morning and i think that that's significant or even uh-huh. late morning like i can't really start writing before like 10 or 11 a.m here whereas i would that be that sounds done. like a good time that's about the no, time that i start writing i don't yeah. i don't like I can get up. Like people are like, "Oh, well, if you start your day earlier, then you know, once you're up and moving around." I'm like, I can't. My brain just doesn't want to write fiction at five a.m. I can do anything else at five a.m. I could work out. I could, you know, I can write nonfiction. Like I was like, "Oh, if I'm going to get up and write like six blog posts, I can do that at five a.m." But this whole idea where you know the only way to be a successful writer is to be part of the five a.m. writers club is like complete bullshit to me. Like. I'm not that person. I, just, I tried it last year mm-hmm. during NaNoWriMo and it was horrible. I was cranky. Mm. So I did it for like two weeks and I was like, nah, this is not me. That's a no for me, dog. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it really That's was. That's your quote for the episode. That's a no, <laughs> That's a no for, for me, for dog. Me, dog. <laughs> I really can't. Um, and I think... Because I'm like you were saying, like 10 a.m., 11 a.m., that's like prime writing time for me. That's when yeah. I really feel like I can get into a groove, but also it's in the middle of the fucking day. So, right. It's, I mean, if you're working a day job, it's not convenient. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm lucky in that the stuff, the other commitments I have are mostly evening because, again, it's so much later here. The stuff I had to do on the west coast of this other stuff i was doing stuff at 7 a.m and all this mm-hmm. stuff and now i'm everything that was 7 a.m west coast is now um like 5 p.m and later right. in central european time so it's you know it's just shifted and it was pretty effortless we didn't say oh well now i mean we used to go to bed at nine o'clock when we were <laughs> done and now i'm like going to bed at like one in the morning oh and wow there isn't it doesn't feel that different to me i'm just like okay this is how i do it now all right I mean, you're pretty much still in your same schedule. Your your body, your circadian rhythm is still probably on West Coast schedule. So you haven't changed a whole lot. I mean, what were we just saying before we got on this call? Time is a construct. Like, <laughs> Yeah, we're kind of the, the true detective. Time is a flat yeah, it's, circle. It's a flat circle. Uh, none of it makes sense to me. I don't, I don't think me. anyone knows what that means, though. I, I, I don't a flat know. circle. Please leave. I, comments if you do know what that means yeah i have never been able to figure it out i don't even think matthew mcconaughey knew what it meant but he, he definitely like delivered he sounded like he knew it though he delivered that line with such confidence that he did you know i mean i think it's a flat circle means that it's just a construct like it's it just, just keeps it's, going it just i get the going, circle man. it's the flat circle that the flat me. thing does confuse me but yeah so i think that as far as time goes, like as, as we're drawing closer to daylight savings time, which I loathe, if we could just listen to what our human body is telling us, we don't have to change uh, how, like how late we stay up or how early we get up. If we were all just working in our, what do you call it? Like the, hmm, there's like the sweet spot that everyone has. And mine is right. like between 11 and 2. I work mm-hmm. really good between that time. Two o'clock, I want to take a fucking nap. Yeah, I do too. And we should all be allowed to take naps at two. Because that's what every human wants to it. do. I mean, like, kids do it. Why can't we do it? Why Why is it that once you graduate from elementary school, you can no longer l- nap? I don't know. I mean, the Spanish are all for it. You can move to Spain, look, you, then you get to nap, nap Europe, your guts Europe out. Is, look, for two hours, you eat your yeah. big meal in the middle of the day, and then you yeah, nap and you for take two a hours. nap. Sounds great. But yeah, I, I think it. that if we all just worked and that figured out what our, our most productive time is and worked then instead of following all these dumb rules, like you get up at 5 a.m. and you write this many words and you have to do this to be a real writer, well, like writer with a capital W type shit. Yeah, of course. I think this is something that's interesting, too, about doing NaNoWriMo is that there is something about it that simultaneously makes you feel like okay if I can do this I'm a legitimate writer but then there's fear that if you don't do it this way that you're not and there are tons of people who would not ever like published professional full-time novelists who don't write a hundred a thousand six hundred sixty seven words a day or even write every day right that too so I think it's a tool 
I think it's important to think of NaNoWriMo as a tool rather than a requirement or... Yeah. I mean, people get so into the rules around it is what it is. And now, like, you know, people in creative writing courses are actually teaching to this sort of thing, like 5 a.m. Writers Club and like 2,000 words a day and all this other bullshit that makes you a capital W writer. Kind of like the whole idea where people are not really paying a lot of attention to craft. No one is really trying to find their own process. They always want, it's like a a shortcut. Everybody wants a shortcut to the process. They don't really want to have to discover it for themselves. Because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of navel gazing. Like you have to be really fucking self-aware to figure out what type of writer you are. And people don't want to do that. They just want they want the the bulleted list of what to do next. And then when it comes to craft, it's the same thing. Nobody wants to actually learn how to write a book. They just want to write the book and then give it to someone else to fix it. And like, this is not how it works, baby. (laughs) Like, I'm gonna, these are all the things that that are wrong. Now I want you to fix these things and then come back to me in six weeks, (laughs) because I can't do this for you. Um, And I think a lot of the literature that we're seeing now out there is a reflection of that like I I, I'm always super careful to say I don't dislike NaNoWriMo but there's some aspects of it that make people into writers but not great writers yeah I think there is I mean being able to sprint is one thing but being able to write something that you're really pleased with and that works is another and I I, NaNoWriMo is about word count it is not about revision and it is Mm -hmm. not about polishing that's a separate thing that happens afterwards I think I think you can write with the ultimate goal in mind and you can be more mindful as you're writing rather than just mm-hmm. like blah you know writing down the hill this thing on the page <laughs> like a bunch of scots and you know celt warfare you know i mean i don't think you want to approach them writing that way i mean you will check off your list but i think the thing that i'm seeing coming up a lot lately i was talking to a client about this i've talked to friends about this is that There is a desire, which is completely reasonable, and I have it too, to do something in advance of publishing a book that somehow will tick so many boxes that you're somehow protected from being attacked or hurt in the process. (laughs) Lies. Uh, they're lies. It's not possible. I mean, it's I've told so people because people will say like, oh, maybe I should get an MFA or maybe I should do this. And I'm like, if you want to, that's one thing. But if trying to put degrees between yourself and the reader so that it feels safer um, putting work out there and then having it potentially criticized is not going to give you the result that you want it's not possible to share work without getting feedback period the only cure for that is really to be criticized through the whole process like you need to have thoughtful and specific critiques from the moment that you start putting words on a page. If you if your plan is to share it, to publish it, to submit it, then you need to get used to. The only way to inoc- your, inoculate yourself against the pain of being judged is to continuously get judged before you even publish. That's how I feel. Like, I, yeah. I, I think that a lot of people, like, you see all these authors behaving badly and all this kind of shit. Like, this shit happens all the time in the romance world because these people are just not used to receiving critique. They just, they think... Everybody's supposed to love everything they put on a page. And that's just not how it works, little sweetie. No, it's not going to happen. You need uh, Tasha's homeopathic critique method. Take small doses of critique. So <laughs> that you're exactly. Immune. Just a little I, tiny I bit of arsenic is plan. not going to kill you. Yeah, it's <laughs> you, just going to, you know, just try it. Little, little time. You'll be like um, in The Princess Bride. You just do your little dose of Iocane. So then you're immune there you go. over time. And then it doesn't bother you at all. I mean, I don't think it's ever possible for it not to bother you. But I do think that thinking that you've failed if you get a negative response to your work is is, you're never going to hit that goal. And that's not fair to put Mm -hmm. on yourself. And so I think something like Nano, where you're really putting a lot of words out there and you're really inhabiting in the story of your book, that can really connect you to it. And at the same time, later, when you put it out there, you're just going to have to let it go. And it's okay. Yeah, there's always going to be another idea. There's always going to be another book. But like treating things that are st- treating the process and your book like it's so fucking precious is a thing that I need it to go away. Like now, yesterday, there's so many people is like, oh, this is my tiny baby book, and please don't hurt it. No, I can't promise you that. 
I can't promise you, like I've had, I've had clients say to me, it's like, oh, well, now that you've edited, am I going to be guaranteed to be published? I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Like that there's no guarantees. And if you self publish there's no guarantees that people are going to like the book. It's just, even if the traditional publisher publishes that there's no guarantee that somebody's going to like the book either. That's, yeah. That's not, but I think the thing to remember is that we don't write books just so other people will like them. That is, if that was the whole point, I don't think so many people would want to do it. No. You, you write books because writing a book not changes books. you. <laughs> you yeah. Can't. Also because you can't not do it because you go crazy if you don't, but also because of the process that happens as you're writing. That's just as important, if not more so in my opinion, than what somebody else thinks about your book later. I think that that, for me, it definitely is for me, like to challenge myself, like the the act of writing is a challenge to me, no matter how many books I write. And I think if more people were paying more attention to challenging themselves, instead of, you know, worrying about things they can't control that are outside of their control, like you can't control who likes it or who reads it or how many reviews you get, you can't control that that's outside of your control. All you can do is write the best book that you can write. And if you're constantly challenging yourself, to learn new things, new story, ways of storytelling, um, mixing genres or, you know, that sort of thing. Like I'm always looking for ways. It's like, how can I challenge myself on this next book? Let me find the most difficult topic that I can to write about and try to make it funny and sexy and all that. I think that NaNoWriMo is probably that more that to me. Like if yeah. I am, if I am going to start a new project for NaNoWriMo, I'm looking for different ways to challenge myself, not just to keep writing the same book over and over. Definitely. I think that figuring out what feels like a piece of writing that's going to help you grow or expand or see things differently is, I mean, that's part of the reason why you don't write just one book. If it was just about writing one book and you check that off your life list, then that's fine. I mean, people do that. But I think there is something, every book is different just because you've written one book the next book is going to be different. It's going to have different needs. It's going to have different challenges, different processes. It's all different. Yeah. So I think this is a good time to just jump into it. Yeah, definitely to discover your process. Like that's, that's how I've always used it. It's just to discover what sort of outlining and planning I can do beforehand that'll make this easier, which is, you know, that's the lie of all lies. Writing is never going to be easy. (laughs) The, that is that is so true. You just think, oh, if I have this nice list, and we do this all the time. Like if I have an MFA, if I have this, it's going to make it so much easier and I'm going to have no problems. And if I have a spreadsheet and a list and a scene list and character, do a character questionnaire and I answer all these questions, then the thing is going to write itself and it never writes itself. I mean, that stuff definitely helps. Um, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, but no, it's not. No, it doesn't hurt. But like I could never... Like, I've only pantsed one book in my life. Like, there's no way I could just free for all, free write a whole book ever again. That sounds like torture. Yeah, none of these tricks and tips make it easier. And I think that's what it is. Like, I think NaNoWriMo is definitely a proving ground. And it and it establishes the fact that writing is work. It's not fun and games. It's not for play play, you know? Like, people think writing is supposed to be easy. Or if you're good at it, it's easy. That's another thing. It's like, oh, if I was better at writing, it would be easy. I'm like, no, these are lies, little darling. All of it's hard. No, it's never easy. But I mean, it. some things are, that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable. Right. I think people think, oh, it's hard. It's supposed to feel terrible. And it doesn't. I think it feels great. But it's like, you know, it's like after you feel after a workout, you're like, I'm yes. gl- really glad I did that. But I need a nap. <laughs> in the middle of it, in the middle of it, I'm definitely like, this is bullshit. I hate this. You know what I mean? But afterwards, especially after I've published and read, I read oh, the yeah. book, like a reader, I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. You know, like there's, it's definitely like a workout or like getting yep. your teeth cleaned. You know what I mean? Like this, <laughs> <laughs> this like, is oh, not man. a pleasant experience. Like, I got to go to the dentist. That's how it feels when you're in it. When you're mm-hmm. in the shit, it feels like shit. But once you're done, it feels great. And I think if a lot of writers were talking more about the process like being in the process like that or even like when there's a lot of conversations around writer's block and it's it's more victimhood type stuff it's like oh my muse won't talk to me i'm like uh so go rattle her sit on her lap you know like you can't just sit around and talk about like i can't write i'm so blocked that's not 
that's not a way to become a better writer. If you always are, right. are succumbing to, you know, outside events or if you get to a block, you think that, oh, this is this is where I have to stop. I can't because I can't figure it out. Then that's a problem. <laughs> like you need to. Fig- I think that's something that Nano helps with is just that even if you have a block, you just go through it just and keep or you it. take it. Yeah, you just keep writing. So I think it's that may be one of the most useful parts about it is that you find mm-hmm. a way to keep writing words no matter what so that you know you can. I think, I mean, I think writer's block could be a whole topic for a whole episode we could do, but... I don't believe in it. Yeah, I think it's... <sighs> I think it's something that... Usually, there's something that's trying to be communicated, in my opinion. It's mm-hmm. like, if you feel blocked, it may... For me, it's usually I feel bored or unclear about something, and I don't want to write what I have planned because it's not working. And so then I feel blocked. So I think the key then is to look at the plan and say okay is this boring to me am I not feeling this is this direction not working and if I clarify that then it's easy to write again yeah I think it's mostly for me whenever I quote unquote feel blocked um it's fear of not getting the scene right like okay Mm. there's this huge plot point here and I need to write this I will write around that motherfucker until You know, like, I'm just going to write around the scene and get everything else around it perfect. And then I'll come back to it. But I think the the idea that like, oh, once you're blocked, you just stop. It's like this this universal idea for writers. Like, we all like to sit around and drink our whiskey and cry about how we can't write. We can do the drinking whiskey part and you can cry for a minute. But yeah, move on, you know, and, and NaNoWriMo is definitely like the first time that I ever figured out that I didn't have to write in a straight line. Like I could figure out the hard part and then double back later. And you can write backwards. Yes. Right. I'm really, backwards. I'm, I am really, I'm really excited into, about this. Yeah. I'm really into I this I kind of want to write the last scene of my book now. I'm kind of excited about it. And then say, okay, well, what, what happened before? How do I get here? Okay. Okay. Here's the challenge though. This, I'm, I'm kind of into this. <laughs> what if, if, Instead of pantsing from the beginning, Pants you knew the end. that end scene and said and what happened before and you did a memento on it and you didn't necessarily know that would be so fun. It would also. But how do you know that's the end? Of, that's the end of the story. It could have really because you've the decided beginning. it is. You can you've decided it is. I don't know. If you I can, can change it when you way. revise. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I could trick myself that, <gasps> that well, but that oh would be God. really that would see, see where this is how you challenge yourself as a writer. Yes. You know, like you have to. It's it's basically reverse engineering this fucking plot. Like exactly. I need to figure out what the fuck is going on here. So I'm into the I idea. Kinda, from I kind of like it. I might I might do that for my next book. I'm kind of excited. I'm excited enough that this will motivate me to get through this first draft of this mm-hmm. book. And then I can do that for the next one. I think that beginning at the ending is always going to be part of my process. I've done that's how I've written most of my books. I like to write the first chapter last. I mean, the, the last chapter first. <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think both is actually pretty good because you yeah. don't normally know the beginning until you've written the whole thing. You don't know what mm-hmm. like the clearest point is at the beginning, you know, like around when it happens. But I think the scene of what needs to be the first scene isn't clear until the end. But exactly. you need to know what you're driving for. So I think you should do both. I think you write the first scene last and you also write the last scene, scene first. first. So you write the last scene first, then you write like somewhere around the beginning to the end. And then you know, it's like writing a nonfiction book where you write the introduction last. Mm-hmm. You know what the introduction is only when you've done the Written whole the thing whole book. and you have um, a sense of all that it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. We're cracking the code right I'm, now. Look, I'm cr- no, we're not. It's all lies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we think we are. We feel really smart right now. We feel so smart. But <laughs> I'm yeah. superior. Um, but uh, then we'll go try it NaNoWriMo and be like, oh, like, by the way, that idea. This is a complete idea, fail. That complete was crazy. Fail. We're not sure what we were thinking. But uh, it's worth a shot. So worth a shot. Well, because, you know, when you're thinking about the ending, it's really just like an opposite view of the beginning, like where your character started, how to, it needs to be, they need to have changed in the end. And who did you right. want them to be in the end? You know what I mean? Like once you decided who you want your character to be in the end and what their world looks like at the end, it would be easier to write the beginning. 
And that's why I like to write the last chapter or the last scene because it's like, okay, this is the, the mother of a mess. This, this character is at the beginning, but how does she progress and change and develop? Right. Get to to get to this ending. This could also, who Jesus, this could also like eliminate the whole idea of outlining to begin with. Like if you just start with a character. Start with a character, write the first chapter, I mean, write the last chapter, write the first chapter, and, and then, then write just... the middle. Yes. Oh my God, you're fanning yourself. It's hilarious. <laughs> yes. You all I can't mean, see, but she's sitting here fanning herself. Like, what? Um, I know. I'm getting like red in the face. I don't know. There's a lot of I'm energy very... coming up from this. <laughs> I think this is kind of a cool idea. I don't know if everyone should please comment and say how you feel about this because we're feeling very excited. I. I, I mean, energetically, just, it definitely feels on point. Like, it feels like this could definitely... It feels like there's, like, energy bouncing off this. I'm feeling... It's, I kind of wish we were recording right the now. video because I'm making <laughs> weird hand gestures and we're, like, waving. It's a little bit of a dance move. Yeah, I, I think it's... I think we're onto something. I'm excited yeah. about it. I like this idea a lot. Uh, and, I mean, I really like it because, like, the, the outline portion, like outlining scenes i can outline scenes as i go but like figuring out the huge story arc and all that stuff beforehand it's really taxing so if i could just use the character sketches which i do really 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 in depth write the last chapter write the first chapter and then just figure Connect it out the dots yeah and then i think the other thing to remember is that nobody takes the draft that they wrote in NaNoWriMo and then just hits publish. <laughs> um, uh, no I one mean, should. No one well, yeah, should. I, I think that, well, sir, I think that the fear maybe is like, well, what if things change as I'm writing this middle and I've already written the end? You can revise. I mean, yeah. I think you write the end scene as best you know how, which is what I would do, mm-hmm. knowing that the process of writing the middle and what leads up to it is going to change that a bit and that in the revision process those things will be smoothed out and, right. and clarified you, this I mean, is not just this, this is not is, carved in stone this yeah, is a it's first not the Ten commandments no but we're also assuming that people are going to revise because we that's just our process but right. i think a lot of people hear nanowrimo and it's like oh i wrote a book publish i mean you could but i i wouldn't recommend it i wouldn't advise it also, because I, I think people have fears of revision, but if revision's kind of amazing. It's so, my favorite part. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's my favorite part because drafting is so hard to me. Like revising is just like, oh, the words are already there. I can fix something that's already there. Yep. I can't fix shit that's just still coming out of my brain goo. So coming out of my brain goo. <laughs> that's what it feels like. Like it just feels Ugh. sticky, like slimer yeah. from fucking ghostbusters like everything like it's just leaving this slimy residue it's like and now uh, what i do know that nanorimo has helped me not do is revise while i'm writing oh yeah i could be writing a chapter i'm like this is all complete bullshit i'm probably gonna cut this out anyway but whatever just push it aside and move on you know yes it did help me with that practice because i think that's why it took me like two years to finish my first book because i would go back to, like before i would start writing for the day i would go back and read the whole book all oh the until, no yes yes girl yes don't it do was, it don't do it don't do it that does not help that does not help oh it felt goodness. like it was at the time <laughs> i know it does we do all these things and then you know we figure them out as we go but yeah. i hope um I hope that this has inspired you all listening and that maybe if anybody tries this writing from the end, please do tell us. Yeah. And tell us what you do with NaNoWriMo. I would love to hear. So please yeah, because leave a lot comments of people, in the show notes. A lot of people only use it to write new projects. And I think there's a whole slew of us that are just using it to finish a project that no one ever talks about because we're not real participants, I guess, because we've written all these other words on the project, I guess. I know we're yeah. sneaky. We're, we're, we're cheaters super cheaters but i i think it's worth i think it's worth trying different ways and and using it using all of this energetic like universal international momentum that's happening around this Mm -hmm. time of year and and then plug that into your writing i think that's worth it yeah because that's the best part of nano is the the cult feeling of it you know (laughs) i love being in a cult yes i love it um writing cults I mean, it makes sense, though, because it's such a solitary, you know, mm-hmm. occupation, like just having so many people 
doing the same thing at the same time and feeling that connection, it's really important, um, which is why it's so successful. Exactly. So just using that energy is a great idea. Totally. Uh, to finish whatever kind of project that you want to do. Awesome. 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 Well, thank you for coming on to talk about this. I was very excited to, <laughs> to have you back. And uh, I knew this was going to lead to some good stuff. Yes. I, I, I knew I mean, it. I'm, Always. I coming on your podcast. It's like one of my favorite podcasts to come on. Oh, you're Aww. so sweet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to say aw all day if we don't wrap aww. it. Um, aw. <laughs> Thanks, Tasha. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.